John chapter number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is written by the Apostle John, the one who was the fisherman who had been called by Jesus to follow him. He would become a fisher of men. It's been over 60 years since he had seen Christ. 60 years of walking with him, seeing the power of God manifested in this man. 60 years since he was the one disciple that was at the cross, standing with Jesus' own mom. 60 years since he had seen the one Son of God who became the Son of Man, who left heaven's portals to come down here and walk this earth be hated in such an amazing way. People yelling and screaming and spitting on him. He had been beaten in such an amazing way. His beard pulled from his face. And all those years later, John remembered and penned these words. Look in verse number 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The, seeing Jesus was not like seeing any other man. A man who only knew how to love. A man who always cared. Who always gave. Who always wanted more for others than he did for himself. He really wanted nothing for himself just to be a tool or a vessel in the hand of God to bring blessings for his others. And, and whether it was seeing a child or, or healing someone who could not walk or seeing someone who was full of leprosy or maybe just a broken heart, he saw the glory of God manifested in this man. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. Now here are the words I want you to see. Full of grace and truth. Now look in verse number 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, now add your blessings upon your word. You are the word, the living word. We're not proclaiming what we think, what we won't. We're not proclaiming that which is of the flesh of man, but the living, powerful, inspired, infallible, inerrant, inexhaustible word given to us. Come, Holy Spirit. Speak, Holy Spirit. Your children are listening waiting on every word that comes from you. Whisper to us personally. Let us hear and know that it is you. Lord, give us a moment, a moment in time that can change all of eternity. Oh God, we need you. Lord, we need you. Every hour, and Lord, in this hour, speak to us personally. And sir, we'll be very grateful to give you all the honor and glory and blessing. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. I can only imagine what John was thinking. He had walked all those years. He was there at Pentecost when 3,000 souls were saved and baptized. He was there when the people who hated Jesus now turned their hatred towards Him. He was there when they told Him that He could not preach in this name, like, name of Jesus. He was there when they replied back, we cannot help but preach the things that we have seen and we have heard. I believe that needs to be our prayer today. We need to live. We need to speak we need to love the things that we have seen, that we have experienced, 
that we have heard and that have changed us. He is the living truth, but we need to live that living truth in us. John used those two words about speaking of Jesus, grace and truth. John grew up going to synagogue and hearing sermons like us. He knew what it was like. He was probably that rambunctious boy running up and down the aisles of the, of the synagogue. Probably looked to his parents and said, can you not control that boy? They even used this nickname for James and John. They called them the Sons of Thunder. I believe they had some mischief maybe in them just a little bit, don't you? And yet we talk about these two, and they had been in synagogue, and they had heard the sermons. They had seen the, the scribe or the priest get up and unroll the scroll and read the words of God. Now, hold on. Those scrolls were kept in synagogue. They didn't have scrolls at their house. They didn't have a copy of God's Word. The Word that I believe that we take so very, very, very much for granted, the inspired, infallible, inerrant, inexhaustible, direct Word for us. They didn't have a Ability to come in and open it up like we do. I, I'm a little bit of a, I, I'm a Bible hoarder. I just love Bibles. I've got, I can't really tell you how many Bibles I have. I, I can tell you that beside my bed uh, where my books are stacked, I, I've got stacks of books many places, but I probably, this is no exaggeration whatsoever, I've got a, over a dozen Bibles just right there by my bed. Matter of fact, I had to confess to my wife, I bought two more. It's almost a habit. I bought one, I saw it, and it was, it was uh, about 60% off, and it was called the Archaeological Study Bible. And it had all the footnotes where these people who have been studying the archaeological findings for over two, around 2,000 years, uh, all those that have been coming forward, and, and the scholars that really have really lit up in the last 100 years, and I had the pictures and all that stuff, and I said, oh, I just want that so much, and I bought me another one. But you know, it's that those words inside the covers that mean so very much to us. They, uh, they speak to us at different days and different times and different circumstances and different things that we were going through. Matter of fact, many times I've read the Word in the morning and found out that that day I needed the application of that Word to meet the circumstances of that day. But God speaks. God speaks so very much. And John penned those words, grace and truth. A lot of people today, when they look at the Old Testament, and they say, I don't really like the Old Testament too much. I'd rather just stick with the Gospels. I, I'd, I'd rather just read the words written in red. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say written in red? Some versions of the Bibles will have Jesus' words, and they won't be in black and white, they'll be in red. And I believe that Jesus' words are highlighted and they mean something special to me. But please hear this. All of God's Word is good. It's profitable, helpful, in my life, needful. A lot of people look at the Old Testament and they kind of discount it a little bit. But I'm here to tell you, it's important. It's important because it talks about the nature of God, the love of God, the goodness of God and how God loves us so very much, but yet sometimes we can be stubborn and sometimes we want to follow our own way. But hear me, hear me well. The grace of God is in the Old Testament too, as well as truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Grace can be defined in many ways. I simply define it today as saying this, grace is the all-giving love of God just for you where you are. 
It's the love of God for you where you are. And truth, truth is the blessings, is God being honest with you right where you are. And I need the love of God right where I am. But I also need the, for Him to be uh, honest with me and tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth right where I am. I need it all. So in the Old Testament, you can see how God was loving His people and calling His people and, and proclaiming His truth to them. And to those who listened, great things happened. But sometimes, stubborn as they are, they went their own way. They found out God can't bless sin. God won't bless sin. God may love you with His grace, but don't ever think for a second that He's just going to overlook your sin and bless your life when you have unrepented sin in your life. If you've got cancer in your life, the doctor will tell you, get rid of it. We need to get rid of it. If you've got unrepentant sin in your life, the Holy Spirit will say, get rid of it. Get rid of it. We need to understand that that grace and truth is there. It, don't you think it's unique that John, when, when he's talking about the Word that became flesh, proclaimed it as grace? We like that part. But truth, that part that we need that we might want to overlook, we don't need to overlook. The Word of God is God's Word for us. It's living and it's active in our life. The spirit that inspired the writers to write the word, the infallible, inerrant, God-breathed word, is the same Holy Spirit that speaks to you when you read it. <coughs> I've had people tell me, they've read it, they just don't understand it. Well, maybe you need to do what I do. When I read the Word of God, I'll say, Lord, let it become real to me. Let it become alive to me. Speak to me, Lord, through your Word. Maybe there's times that after I say those words and I begin reading, that, that God will begin to speak. Now, can I give you what Preacher Brian does? This is the Preacher Brian brand of how I read the Word of God. Now, I think you need to have some kind of a plan to read through the Word of God. If not, you're going to find that there's some passages that you'll read over and over and over again, but there's other things that you may ignore. I think you need to try to read it all, Old Testament and New Testament. And, and if you come to me and say, Pastor, I need a reading plan, I'll help you find one. But there's many of them, many that are out there that will help you read <coughs> the whole counsel of the Word of God. But you, what I do is I'll take up and I'll read it, and I'll read it until it speaks something to me. Now, I think too many people, it's like checking off a, a, checking a box off. Well, I read my Bible today, and they just read it through and they close it up, and I've read my Bible. Well, hold on, hold on. This is not just like any other book. It's alive. It wants to speak. I said this in the first service. I said, uh, if you want to have a relationship with one, someone, you need to be able to talk to them, but they need to be able to talk to you too. Y'all believe in prayer? We need to talk to God, amen? But God needs to talk to us as well. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll read. Now, hold on. Some people say, well, I just open my Bible and wherever I find it, I, well, amen, it's all good, but you might need a reading plan a little bit more than that. One time I was going through a, an extremely hard time, extremely hard time in my ministry, and I needed a fresh word from God. And, and, and God said, just open the book. And I opened it up, and I put my finger down, and it was a verse that spoke. It, it really gave me the leadership and guidance that I needed to walk, that I literally walked for the next 18 months to the valley of the shadow of death. And, and it was exactly what I stood on, that promise that I found right there. But you need to be careful about doing that only. You heard about the person who opened up the Bible and they 
wanted a word from God, and they put their finger down, and they looked down, and it said, and Judas went out and hung himself. And they said, I think I need a further word. So they flipped it open again and put their finger down, and it said, what you do, do quickly. And he said, I definitely need a further word than that. I, I think God wants us to, to look at it systematically and go through it. So sometimes I'll just open my word, and, and right now in my, my daily quiet time, I used to read three, oh, well, I still do many times, but uh, I used to read three chapters of the Old Testament, three chapters of the New Testament, three chapters of Psalms, and one of the Proverbs. And I would read that every day, ten chapters a day. Now I'm just getting really to the place where I, 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 I feel like I'm led to a place, and, and I'll just read until God speaks. And there'll be something there that I haven't seen. And then I'll go back and I'll read that verse again. Matter of fact, I might read the whole paragraph that it's in. Or I might even go back and read that whole chapter again. Maybe it's just me, but I'll read it two, three, four times. Then I'll go back to look at that verse, and I read the verse, and then I begin to think about it. I haven't seen that word before. What does that word mean to me? And I'll start seeing how the verb and the noun are fitting together. Or I'll start, a lot, especially in the New Testament, in the Greek, the adjectives, they can just pile those up. And it's good grammar in the Greek. It might not be good English grammar, but it's good grammar in the Greek. And I'll say, why is it that they felt like they needed to put all of those sticks of dynamite in one place? And I'll begin to think about it. And then I'll begin to pray about it. Lord, what is it you're saying there? Lord, what does that mean? Lord, I, I want to make sure I get this right. So I'll read it and reread it, and then I'll think about it, and then I'll begin praying about it, and then I don't really know a good way of describing this, but I'll meditate on it. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind, usually when I think about meditating, is those people who get down and they sit in the floor and they fold themselves up like a pretzel. Y'all know those folks? By the way, I can't do that. I don't do that. I used to run track years ago, and I made a stretch, and I didn't even like it then, right? And some people call it yoga. I don't even like that word. I mean, I like yogurt. If you get some nuts and stuff and put on it, I like yogurt, but uh, I, I don't even want to go there. Amen? If y'all do it, bless your heart. You're a lot more limber than I am. I'm not talking about that when I say meditate on it. I, I like the word marinate. Because I can see what that means. My wife, we're going to have steaks. She'll put a marinade together. My son Jared's in there. Can I get an amen? amen. Oh, that's right. And she'll put that marinade in, and, and I'll stick the steaks down in it. And we'll seal that thing up and we'll put it in the fridge. And something amazing begins to happen. Because that stuff that she whips up in it, it starts to get into that meat. And, and we'll pull them out and I'll throw them on the grill and the smell is an offering under my, under my lungs and it's, it's so wonderful. And I'll take it inside and we'll eat in it. And it's just, it's just, can I say it is good. It is good. And that's kind of what I want the Word of God to do in my heart. I, I want it to encompass me. I want it to infiltrate me. I want it to come into the pores of my life and my emotions, and my thoughts, and my hearts, and, 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 my, and my rough spots in my life. It's like sandpaper that gets rid of the rough spots. And maybe the first time I heard it, but it didn't, I didn't hear it well. Maybe it was the second or the third time when I, when I thought about it, and I prayed over it, and, and with time. And sometimes I'll take that verse that speaks to me that day, and I'll write it down on a three by five card and I'll stick it in my back pocket. And during the day, I'll pull it back out and read it again. And read it again. And God begins to do a work, a moment. And it begins to change me. It begins to form me a little bit. You see, you see the story. But you want to really let it become alive to you in the story. 
I actually believe that you can step into the story. Can I give you an example? Um, Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 1. I love the story where Jesus had been had been with this large group of people and had been preaching to them and teaching to them and helping them to understand the truth. But as he's leaving and there's this group following him, we don't know how many, 20, 30, 40, as they're following him, a man who the Bible describes as a leper came to him and ran and fell down at Jesus' feet. Lord, I believe you can heal me. Lord, if you will, you can heal me. When I read that, I I got thinking about what that person looked like with those sores all over their body. What it was like when they left their family because they had to leave their family behind because they could not live in society with leprosy. And I got thinking about a broken heart and how lonely they would feel. Have you ever felt lonely? Have you ever had a broken heart? And how desperate. And no one else could help. But you heard about this one named Jesus. And I think about the one who ran and, and fell at Jesus' feet. And said, Lord, if you're willing, you can heal me. And I think about all the others who were yelling, unclean unclean, and probably were picking up a rock ready to throw it at him. But the one that he came to did not run from him, but leaned down and touched him. I wonder how long it had been since someone with loving hands touched him. And I read the story, but it's almost like I'm the 13th disciple. I want to be right there watching it. Can you, see? Can you see it when Jesus looked at that one that no one else cared about, but Jesus cared about? And it's almost like Jesus healed him, but because the story has become alive to me, it's almost like Jesus would look over and see me there too and say, and I love you too, and I know your pain too. And just understand, I'm there for you too. You see, the Word of God has transference. There are promises in the Word of God that are real for you as well. Look, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this, For all the promises of God in Him, that it means in Jesus, All the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. The promises that are in the Word of God are there for you too. He wants it to become not a history book, but it's His book. It tells history, yes, but it also tells his story. And my life was changed. And I know what it means in Psalms 119 to say, His word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against him. Second Timothy tells us this. Second Timothy tells says in chapter number 3. Let me get there real quick. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, is given by inspiration. It literally means God breathed. Can I, cl- can I, can I key on all Scripture? And it's given for us. It's literally God whispered. God spoke it. And in the book of Psalms 119, 
Psalms 119 in that chapter, 176 verses, the longest chapter in the Bible. But 11 times in that chapter, it says that it was quickened. That's the same word that we use for resurrected or made alive. And literally, I'm reading the Word of God. I might be in Genesis. I might be in Hosea. I was literally talking with a friend this week, uh, a former pastor who, who, was go- who has been through a divorce. And, and it's just killing him. And the pain that is there. And I was talking with him. And I reminded him, have you read the book of Hosea in the last six months? You know what God asked Hosea to do? God may be asking for you to let it come alive in your life. See, I'll be reading it, and all of a sudden the words will jump out of the page, and the word for that is, it quickened in my spirit. It came alive in my spirit. I ask for the Lord to do this in my spirit today. And as I was coming down the road, I I put a cup here. This was given to me by one of the church members. They knew that I get thirsty. Uh, And and praise God for that. Y'all can tell when I get raspy, my voice gets kind of like this. and It helps. So they bought this for me. It's got the church logo on it. They had it made for me. And then they knew my my life verse is Philippians 3.10. Now, there's probably... Very few verses in God's Word that I have read and I have it memorized that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable even unto death. I have meditated on that. I have, But the Word of God is inexhaustible. And I said, Lord, speak to me plainly and clearly even today. Whisper a word for me today. And a verse that I know so well. And I was, I was, I was literally driving down the road to church And I said, that I may know Him. But then I began thinking, I want to know the one who knows all about me. He already knows all about me. I'm just trying to get to know Him. And He knows all about me and loves me anyway. I want to learn more about Him so my love for Him can grow. And... I want to know, the verse says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I know what the Word says about the power of resurrection. I know that Jesus could speak those words and Lazarus could come back alive. But but I want Him to know me. I want the Word of God not just to be knowledge in my head, but to be truths in my heart. You see, I think God can bring resurrection. I believe like I was saying to my my friend, the former pastor, the one who God has a calling on his heart. You see, I think God can bring resurrection there. He did it for Hosea. His wife left him and went out into prostitution. And he bought her back on the slave lot. But not to punish her, but so that he could love her again. You see, to think the, the Word of God becomes a lie. In our spirit. Look in Hebrews chapter number 4. Verse number 12. Hebrews 4.12 says this. For the word of God is living. I like this. Not only living. Powerful. If you're in a place of deficit, you need someone who can reach down in your deficit and bring you back up. The living Word of God can do that. Jesus Christ is right where He needs to be, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. But He has sent the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one who comes alongside, that will be with us in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our deficit, who has the power of Genesis 1. When Jesus said, let there be, and He whispered those words, and the power of God took those words and made it come alive. He can meet us there with the same Holy Spirit, with the same need. 
and let the power of God come alive in our life. He says, for the word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Have anybody ever used a dull knife? Come on now. Anybody in here ever been frustrated by a dull knife? Everybody, anybody ever here looked at it and said, that's of good, no good whatsoever. I had a friend, church member, gave me a knife and he said, it might be good enough to cut a thread. By the way, it's right there. I carry it with me. But this is sharper. Sharper than a two-edged sword. I like this because, you see, it's built to help. It says, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. Isn't it amazing how the Word of God can cut through all the other stuff and get to right to the place that we need? And it is, it's piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow. I love this. And it is a, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sometimes when I read the Word of God, it's like I'm looking into a mirror. And it's showing me myself. There is no creature hidden from His sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. You can't hide it from the Word of God. You can't hide it from the whisper that He speaks to your spirit. I hunger for that. I need that. I need more of Him and less of me. But the Word of God is of no value until it's applied. I know some people who can quote chapter and verse but have no clue what those verses are saying. I know people who love a good Bible study and they love to hear somebody teach the Word of God. It's like they're trying to Increase the library of their mind, but it never penetrates down to their heart. You see, I think the greatest message is not the one that I preach, but it's the one that is lived. Spurgeon said, some people whose Bible is worn down and torn the most are the ones whose lives are the most intact. You might wear the cover off. Matter of fact, I had to quit preaching out of one of my Bibles because the back end of it broke for the third time and i got to glue that thing down again. How many of y'all know the glue don't last as much as it used to? Need some better glue. But we need to make this part of our every day. What good does it do if we can't get it off the page and into our heart? What good does it do to know that the Bible says that you're supposed to love your neighbor, but you don't really have a desire to love your neighbor? You need more of the Word of God in you. Hide its words in your heart that you may not sin against God. Psalms 119 again, it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. How are we going to know where to go? How to walk? Unless we take it and let it become alive. You know, why should God tell you another word until you obey the word he's already given you? Why is it that he should tell you the great truths of the revelation until you're willing to accept the revelation that he's already given in your heart? 
I'm not nearly as worried about the book of Revelation and what's coming as I am about John 3.16 and him coming to live within my heart. I figure he's got the future taken care of. And as I walk that, he'll make it come alive to me. But I wonder about everyone who has heard the word of God but still hasn't accepted the word of God. They know that he left heaven. They know that he came down and was human and walked on the earth. They know that he walked 30 years or 33 years sinless. They know that he was crucified for things that he did not do. And yet they could not take his life, but he freely gave it. And what they took, he took back. He gave his life, but he was resurrected so that we can have life and have it eternal. So that we can know forgiveness of sins. So we can have a relationship with a God who is the God of grace and truth. Who knows all about us, but we get to know the one who knows all about us. We get to know him more and more. And one day, when I close my life, my eyes to this world, and I leave this world behind, absent from the body, Corinthians tells us, present with the Lord. I'll go to a place, John 14 says, that he's prepared for me. I got my own shingle in heaven. A place, some call it a mansion, some call it a room, I'm going to call it home forevermore. Where my Lord's glory will be the light of that place. And I don't have to worry about sin. I don't have to worry about sorrow. I don't have to worry about heartache. I don't have to worry about brokenness. I don't have to worry about death because I have been given life. And this may not be good English, but it's going to get gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder and gooder. Y'all know what I mean? And when we've been there 10,000 years bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. It's a party without an end glory and honor and praise to the King. Why should God give you another word until you accept that word and accept Jesus into your heart? Christian, what has He already told you that you haven't surrendered to Him? I want more of Christ. Less of me and more of Him.